When are you ever going to finish the book? And when she asked that question, finally, after 10 years of research, because I had discovered that Knapp, Knapp's research was worthless, he had his facts wrong, he hadn't done much research, he hadn't done any manuscript research at all, and he only read four out of approximately 100 Jersey newspapers, and he read those sloppily and uncritically. Finally, I published my findings in my book, Jersey Blue. I found that Knapp's interpretation was not just wrong, but wrong-headed. I discovered that Charles Knapp, to my total amazement, his book reads authoritatively. His introductory paragraph and conclusionary paragraph of each chapter seems authoritative. His father, I found out later, clearly had heavily edited Knapp's book. Then I read it again. Then I read the book again and discovered I mean, on Reconstruction Map doesn't have even a single primary source uh, uh, in that particular chapter. I discovered that Charles Knapp, the author of the 1924 study, had failed to do his homework, had failed to get his facts straight, had failed to interpret the facts sensibly and soundly. In point of historical fact, Jersey was not a breeding ground during the Civil War of Southern reactionaries, slavery sympathizers, state rightists, or Dixie secessionists. Sure, Jerseyans, like Northerners in general, disagreed about how best to maintain the Union but they shared a broad consensus that they must. Most Jersey Democrats remained loyal to the Union, wished to win the war, supported the war effort, but they disagreed with Republicans as to how the war was being conducted by Lincoln's administration. However, the Copperheads, the Peace Democrats, opposed the war itself. The anti-war Copperhead Democrats, the peace wing of the Democratic Party, both in the North and in New Jersey, wanted to cease fire, wanted to recognize the Confederacy. Espousing what they call pure democracy, they champion individual and state rights as if we didn't have a civil war. In treating Jersey Copperheads, observers, especially Knapp, confused a vocal minority of Jersey Democrats for the majority. <coughs> sure, at election time, all Jersey Democrats of every stripe in the state, as elsewhere in the North, hoping to defeat Republican candidates attack Republicans where they were vulnerable. And make no mistake about it, there was much to criticize uh, in Lincoln's administration conducting, fighting, not winning the Civil War. Democrats condemn infringements of civil liberties. Democrats condemn rising taxes. Democrats condemn raging inflation. Democrats condemn increasing draft calls. Democrats condemn mounting battle casualties. Democrats condemn interminable military defeats, especially in Virginia. Democrats condemn recurring strategic stalemate. When were we ever going to win the war? That really wasn't resolved until General Sherman won the Battle of Atlanta 
in early September of 1864, and Lincoln thus won re-election in November of 1864. If democratic criticism did not mean that most Jersey Democrats were copperheads, Republicans unfairly, even cynically, charged this was so to win votes, but it was not so. Yet, to many Republican, to many, the Republican charge made sense because war, especially civil war, generated a frenetic wartime psychology bordering on mass hysteria. This gave rise to wild exaggeration, to dark suspicions of disloyal conspirators at work. But in point of fact, the Copperhead faction of the New Jersey Democratic Party never seized control of the legislature or the governorship. The Copperheads failed to sabotage New Jersey's war effort. The Copperheads failed to wreck military recruitment. The Copperheads failed in 1863 to pass a legislative resolution calling for a unilateral armistice. The Copperheads failed to get Copperhead James Wall elected federal senator for a full term of six years. They failed to get their madcap proposals enacted. Charles Knapp was still wrong. Again, on the conduct of Warren County, if you want me to talk about that later on, I'll be happy to do so during question time. Moreover, Jersey's political experience in wartime was neither exceptional nor unique. Jersey's experience parallel political developments in other northern states, especially in the northern, the lower northern states that border the border slave states, the green states that stayed in the Union. Yes, Jersey elected by mistake, by ignorance, some silent, stealth coppers to Congress, just as in other northern states did. Yes. Jersey voters elected a Democratic governor in 1862, Joel Parker, just as New Yorkers did in electing Horatio Seymour. Yes, Jerseyans elected a Democratic legislature in 1862, just as Indiana and Illinois voters did. But Jersey Democrats never went to the extreme of nominating a Copperhead as their gubernatorial candidate, as happened in New Hampshire, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. The Jersey Democratic legislators never adopted explicit anti-war resolutions that Delaware's legislature did, that the State House of Representatives of both Pennsylvania and Illinois did, and Jerseyans never resorted to violent protests as New Yorkers did in July 1863 when they rioted against the draft and attacked blacks and bashed the heads of black babies in Manhattan on fire hydrants. Still, Jersey copperheads left a misleading, gave a misleading impression of Jersey politics at the time. In 1863, the Republican Somerville Unionists conceded, and I quote, a great deal of senseless, unjust, ignorant criticism is fulminated against New Jersey as a copperhead state, end of quote. Such charges were believed by many people for that newspaper, the Republican Somerville Unionist concluded, lies well reiterated have all the pungency of the truth, end of quote. In the heat of war hysteria, the charge made sense to credulous observers, especially when it invited Jersey bashing by New Yorkers, Pennsylvanians, and others. The depiction of New Jersey as a copperhead state 
as a reactionary disloyal state misrepresents the state's wartime role and record. New Jersey's wartime governors, Republican Charles Olden, who served 21 months during the war, and Democrat Joel Parker, who served 29 months and during the war, were outstanding war leaders and truly great war governors. And they worked tirelessly, resourcefully, effectively, to suppress the Southern Rebellion by vigorously prosecuting and winning the war to crush the rebellion. Their record shows that governance of New Jersey was as soundly unionist as the state's solid combat record. <clears throat> Most Jerseyans rallied to promote the common defense. Lincoln, Olden, called Jerseyans to enlist to defend the Union. They did. Lincoln, Olden, Parker encouraged additional enlistments. They grew. Officials asked Jersey legislators to pay to recruit and equip troops by state appropriation. They complied. When Washington imposed conscription, it permitted respectable patriotic alternatives. They swelled. Considering Jersey's wartime record, the Freehold Herald concluded, quote, New Jersey does not deserve the slurs that have been passed upon her, end of quote. And the Jersey City Times observed to the Copperheads, quote, these men have given New Jersey a bad name, both inside and outside the state which her people do not deserve, end of quote. Sure, <clears throat> Jerseyans disagreed about how best to maintain the Union, and how and when to end slavery, but most by federal mandate. But most Jerseyans agreed that the Union must be preserved. On the whole, then, Jerseyans left an admirable record quite contrary to the picture painted by previous observers, notably Charles Miriam Knapp, who simply did not do his homework. We did our part with others to crush rebellion, reunite the nation, end slavery. The consensus was summed up in a key port broadside in August 1861, quote, the Union, the whole Union, and nothing but the Union, end of quote. We did our duty in America's worst war. Americans can take pride in New Jersey's wartime participation. New Jerseyans can take still greater pride. Okay, this is the end of my formal remarks. I now open the floor to comments, questions, and condemnations. <laughs> yes? I'm curious that uh, uh, Lincoln lost both times he ran in the state of New Jersey. Oh, uh, he did. He gained, he gained electoral votes in 1860. In the presidential election in 1864, uh, the General McClellan, who was fired by Lincoln, and who lived uh, in the summers in New Jersey, he later permanently lived in New Jersey, and was elected a governor uh, in the middle of the 1870s. People uh, had speculated when McClellan was elected governor, he would be the future Democratic presidential nominee again. After he served as governor of New Jersey, both the Republicans and the Democrats hated his guts, and nobody talked about McClellan uh, being nominated for the presidency in 1880. However, he won by an extremely narrow margin. Why and how did he win? in New Jersey. Well, first he was considered a Jerseyan. But secondly, and more importantly, all Democratic legislatures, fearing that soldiers and sailors 
uh, would vote more for Lincoln than for McClellan, each Democratic, every Democratic legislature in the North prohibited absentee ballots. So Jersey soldiers and sailors <laughs> mainly did not vote in the November presidential election in 1864. However, one year later, those Jerseymen who had pulled duty in the United States Army and Navy came home. And they were mad as hell that they did not have the right to vote in 1864. And they voted in November 1865, one year later. And a Republican, Marcus Ward, was elected governor of the state of New Jersey, thanks to the angry soldiers and sailors who were now getting even. Don't get mad, just get even. Yes? The, um, the minority that didn't like Lincoln. Yes, they hated him. Yeah, and my great-great-grandfather was one of them, and he, they, they sent him to jail. <laughs> was that, was, were there many people that were in uh, jail as a result? I had a student look at the records, and uh, no one had long jail time but maybe something like 24 <laughs> had some jail time. Most of them uh, were arrested, but the charges were dropped. We, the charges varied in their uh, validity, but um, a, a charge that you are encouraging somebody not to serve in the United States Army was a serious charge, uh, and uh, it was brought against some copperheads and a couple in Warren County. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, Lincoln really and uh, the Attorney General of the United States, as well as generally federal authorities, the United States Attorney for New Jersey, uh, did not get involved in this. However, in the border slave states, especially in the states of Delaware, but <coughs> most especially Maryland, Lincoln, in effect, clamped down a military government for a while. And in the early years of the Civil War, uh, the commanding general of the United States Army uh, in Annapolis uh, was the real governor of Maryland. And uh, various members of the legislature and newspaper editors found themselves uh, for a time in jail. Or to put it another way, in the supreme emergency of the Civil War, if we, Lincoln knew, and acted, if we lost the border slave states, if the North lost the border slave states, the North would not have won the Civil War. Because we would have to fight in those states instead of in the Deep South. So by hook or by crook, and the situation varied from state to state, and if you want me to talk in detail about it, I'll be very happy to do so. Uh, Lincoln cut corners in the border slave states, in some states more than others. He handled each state differently. So his, for example, his actions in Maryland were simply ruthless. In Kentucky, however, he handled it more deftly as the diplomat, but nonetheless secretly gave guns uh, to pro-union people in Kentucky. Uh, so things varied from state to state. 
Uh, in New Jersey, uh, there was no great fundamental problem. Uh, Lincoln knew the score. Lincoln, I, I, I should add here, uh, and I know I don't want to scandalize you, but I will. I would not have voted for Lincoln in the presidential election of 1860. Why? Because unlike Douglas, Lincoln lacked national experience. And Lincoln had no administrative experience. So I would not have voted for him because I think in general, there are exceptions, but in general, and I certainly think Lincoln is an exception. <coughs> Your track record before you become president is all important, normally. Lincoln's track record was mediocre. I would not have voted for him, but I would have enthusiastically voted for him for a re-election in November of 1864. Lincoln had the capacity to learn. Lincoln had the will to learn. Lincoln had the ability to learn. And he learned better than any other American president. And he became our greatest president, in my judgment. But that was by no means clear when he became president. Other questions? Yes. Uh, I had a great aunt who lived a very long life, and she told me stories about her Ooh. uncles, an aunt of mine. Yes. Her uncles were in the Civil War, and they hated the Southerners. In your research, what kinds of attitudes prevailed among veterans toward Southerners? Would they uh, feel sorry for them? Did they hate them? Did they respect them? What do you get as an impression of soldiers um, uh, coming the, back? The general, the, uh, the, there were no, uh, hatred was not uh, a general reaction at the start of the war. Angry, anger, yes. Impatience, yes. Uh, but not hatred. When Southerners, well, I might add, Northerners pulled it off as well when atrocities occurred. For example, uh, giving, uh, putting up a white flag that somebody is surrendering and then turning on that person with a gun or a knife or a hatchet. Uh, over time, hatred developed. By the end of the war, um, I would say most Northerners had contempt for Southerners, uh, hated them. Uh, and uh, of course, Southerners uh, still hate us. At least a lot do. Tough. They lost the war. <laughs> Gillette's adage, don't start a civil war if you can't win it. <laughs> Next question. Yes, please. There must be more questions. Yes. Was there an empathy for the South because of the, the cotton, uh, the need for cotton in mills up here and blockade and uh, you know, they weren't getting the product? Well, the, the, ma the, major, the, ma the, the major mills were in England. Uh, we had mills, yes, but uh, uh, we, the Union Army had a policy of trying to capture southern cotton so that our mills would continue. And the Union uh, government, the Lincoln administration, tried uh, to export cotton to England when they desperately needed it. Uh, to, uh, the South didn't play its cards right. Uh, the South exported a, an, excess, an excessive amount of cotton in 1859 and 60. How stupid can you get if you're going to conduct a civil war? You want to hoard it and then get it out before war breaks out. They didn't do that. Uh, the conduct of the Confederate government with certain 
notable exceptions is a conduct of imbecility. In other words, the South did not use the resources it had, and the South did not develop the kinds of things it desperately needed. Moreover, the Navy, the Confederate Navy, was neglected. Uh, great damage was done to northern shipping by relatively few uh, Confederate vessels and privateers. Uh, the South was obsessed and focused overly on the Army, not the Navy. The conduct of the Confederate cabinet compare it to the Lincoln administration of difference of night and day. The Confederate, with, with a couple of exceptions, the members of the Confederate cabinet were generally very poor or mediocre. The Northern cabinets were generally excellent with some notable mistakes and those, those persons in the cabinet that turned out to be a mistake were fired by Lincoln. Uh, so yes, the South had better generals in the early part of the war, uh, but overall, what did General Lee accomplish in Virginia? Tactical brilliance. He outmaneuvered the Yankees. He won many battles, but in the process, strategic failure because too many Southern guys died. And they didn't have men to replace them. So by the end of the war in the trenches around Petersburg, there were very few Southerners left. They didn't have shoes. They were in terrible shape. Young boys were recruited. And then, of course, we mustn't neglect, above all, Jefferson Davis. And the, the, the irony, the utter irony about Jefferson Davis is he was, until the Civil War, the most brilliant Secretary of War we ever had until the Civil War. But he was a rotten Confederate president. He was a rotten Confederate politician. He was a rotten Confederate administrator. He was a rotten <coughs> war leader. Whereas Lincoln, stumbling, failing, making a fool of himself, of himself again and again, learned by his mistakes and prevailed amid adversity and won the war. The Southerners didn't handle things well. By starting war, they shouldn't have started. By seceding, because there were no grounds to secede, but they did. And the inner weaknesses, the inner divisions uh, within the Confederacy got worse and worse and worse, and inflation rates went out of control. The Southerners deserved in every way to lose the war, and I have no tears <laughs> for their loss of the Civil War. They earned it in every way, but we should add, what a waste!